thank you for coming. Uh, I hope you all had <coughs> enough coffee to stay up for the next hour. I'll try to make it uh, not as boring as usual, but uh, maybe I don't manage to. So, feel free to ask me questions anytime. Um, there's a mic there because they are recording the session, so if you can stand up and, and ask there, that's going to be great. Um, I'm going to go through the slides, uh, probably the first half, and then I have some examples to show you. So we can go as deep as you want in any, any of, the, of the parts. So just feel free to interrupt me at any time. So who I am, uh, so that's my Twitter handle, if you want to tweet about the session, how great it is, how amazing, great, all the bad things too, so I know who you are. Um, so I'm a ASF member, long time, Maven committer, also the other build-related projects at Apache, like uh, Archiva, Continuum, and I've done a lot of, uh, let's say, help with other projects too. Uh, I've, involved, uh, I've been involved in other projects at the Clis Foundation, uh, Sprint Security, Fall, you name it, uh, Puppet stuff. So I try to contribute as much as I can, mostly because I want my code to be released on, on those projects. So that's always uh, an encouragement. And, and I work for MaestroDev, which is a startup uh, in, based in Los Angeles, although I live in Spain. And uh, where we do a lot of uh, the automation things, the sort of things that you will see here. So we build a tool called Maestro that it's uh, orchestration for the development lifecycle, source control, source code all the way to deployment to production. And uh, so we basically automate um, all, all these steps in a, in a way nicer way than that can be done with, the, with all the individual tools. So, uh, a little bit of how we got here on the automation world. So you, you are familiar with Agile, I, uh, I suppose. Who is, who's using Agile methodologies here? Yeah, some, some people are wondering if they, they do it. So we have, um, we have all this planning, iterative development, continuous integration, release soon, release often. So what we, we've uh, been through is moving from uh, waterfall methodologies where releases don't happen that often to a model where we do releases pretty often, even several times a day. So there's people that actually do that. Uh, it's like unicorns. They say they exist, but nobody's seen them. But there's, there's some people that actually do that. So several continuous releases. Uh, a lot of people just think about Agile in a different way. So that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the real Agile methodologies. <laughs> and what they... So what we're trying to solve um, on the, let's say, continuous deployment side is uh, with Agile, we try to avoid the fear of change uh, what's going to happen when I make a release and I push this into production? Uh, something really bad is going to happen. Uh, the deployments uh, works in my machine, and all these different teams working on different silos or sections, like the developers work, do their own thing, and then the operations people do their other thing, and uh, they just throw stuff from one to another, and sometimes not in a very nice way. So. What happens is that developers, their main focus is on change, getting new features out, doing more stuff, anything that the business asks for, while the operations people are trying to make everything as stable as possible. So these two concepts kind of clash sometimes. So obviously from the Agile manifesto, uh, so what uh, this is exactly what we're trying to do, focus on the, on the processes uh, make, and the people and make sure that uh, everything goes as nice as, as possible. 
So on the one hand, you have the ops requirements uh, when you're a developer, kind of they look like that, something really complex that you have no idea how it's supposed to work. So you have all these combinations of configuration, operating systems, and you can have that in multiple environments. And for, so for a developer, it's like, how can I deploy this in a repeatable, consistent way uh, to production without manual steps? So as automated as possible. And obviously, with the, with the cloud, you have the same problem, but how do I do this across hundreds of machines? So there's some solutions. Uh, it's not always as simple as it looks. There's some solutions are very simple, but they're not always right. Um, so uh, there's been a movement that probably everybody knows here. Who knows DevOps? DevOps, no, yes, kind, kind of, yeah. <laughs> so, well, who, who considers themselves as developers in this room? Operations people? Doing both of them? Okay. <laughs> it depends how big, usually it depends how big the company is. You may end doing anything, and even sales. And, uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> which is always nice to be in front of a client that tells you how your shit doesn't work. But <laughs> besides that, so the, the DevOps movement became uh, like the mixture of the developers' operations getting together, uh, trying to figure out things together, not independently, like I work, my, I do my stuff on the development side, you do your stuff on the operation side, and we'll figure out later how, how we push things from one place to another. And the always neglected side is the QA part uh, that should always be included, but probably the name is, would be a little bit longer. And it's not so cool now and fancy. But obviously, you should consider QA as part of the DevOps naming conventions, whatever. So there's another nice way to explain what DevOps is, which is to make errors is human, to propagate error to all servers in automatic ways. That's DevOps. <laughs> So that's pretty much what we're trying to accomplish here. When you make mistakes, automatic deployment, your mistakes get deployed everywhere, automatically. You don't need to, you don't need to do anything there. So typically, the um, delivery cycle or development cycle is development, QA, operations. But it's not, or the idea is that you should think about, uh, about it in a different way also, which is the feedback loops, where you should consider what the operation has to say, what the QA people has to say, and not only that, but also tell you, uh, you, could ha you should have access to production logs. You should have access to uh, metrics on how your system as a developer you should have the metrics on how your system is, uh, is doing in production. Um, so just to be clear, when you, talk, when you hear about DevOps, there's a lot of operations people talking about it. Um, my background is completely on the other side, on the developer side. So just have that into account that I'm biased on the, on the development side. So. When you are a developer and you need to push things into, move, the thing, move your uh, development uh, into production, you have to have into account things like the, what uh, packages needs to be installed, what versions of those packages. But also, you have the feedback loops like QA people telling you how testable is your software, how you should change things during development to make your software more testable. And what I mentioned before, like production, you should be able to get metrics and logs and uh, people from operations can tell you what, uh, what security updates you need to, to do in your, in your software and so. So it's not always about the tools, but really it's, it's a methodology or, or a movement, but without the tools, there's no way you can 
actually do it, right? Uh, the same way you can do continuous integration with shell scripts, that's not probably the best way to do it. So something that Patrick Debois said, uh, he's the one that coined the term DevOps, uh, the tools can enable uh, change in behavior and change the culture, same thing like, like the Gutenberg printer did, right? So it's not about the tools, but tools are really helpful. And you, but you'll find out there are uh, also people that, the same way that everything is cloud-enabled nowadays, now there's people saying, well, their tool is DevOps and something or another, right? So there's three key concepts here. One of them, uh, continuous delivery. Uh, the book that uh, these guys wrote on how to that kind of describes what continuous delivery is. So when you have uh, agile uh, life cycle, so even, if, even when you are doing agile, so you still have the development, QA, and operation cycle. So continuous deli delivery kind of sh uh, takes that to the extreme of doing all those phases, phases continuously. And so you do development QA and operations and, and so continuously. So you don't wait until everything goes through QA, you just keep pushing things all the way forward. Another key concept is infrastructure as code, something that uh, Puppet and Chef made really popular. So it's not, not, it's not anything new, uh, but again, is these tools make it really easier, uh, nicer to do. There's obviously you can do anything. Uh, you could do it before. There was a lot of people and operations doing it before, writing their own scripts to automate things. It's just that Puppet or Chef and some other tools out there uh, kind of standardize and helps on, on, on doing it the right, the right way. So I want to talk about <coughs> Puppet. Uh, so Puppet basically uses manifests that are like a Ruby-like syntax. It's their own DSL, but kind of looks like Ruby, although it's not. Um, so that's, that's uh, a typical example. Um, so you can execute some commands. You can define files uh, um, that need to be present or absent, or you can copy files to the machine. Uh, so it covers a, a lot of the, of the different steps there. And infrastructure is code. So you can define as code that I need some package installed, and Puppet is going to run that and install that package for you. So. Um, you are defining as code all the infrastructure that you can you can have in your in your servers. It's important to mention that it's a declarative model, so it, and it describes the state and not the process. This is a common uh, issue with that people are starting to use Puppet have. So you don't define what are the steps to get to some state. You just define the state the state. Something like AND versus Maven, for instance. And AND, you describe all the different steps. Uh, Maven, you just say, what are your dependencies and what you want to do, whether it is building a jar or a war or something. So this is important because let's say you have to create a directory to create a file. So if you need to do things in order, you uh, need to make sure that you define that uh, they ordered explicitly because that's the, it's the end state what matters to Puppet. And if you run Puppet several times, uh, that also you also need to ensure that the state is consistent. Um, so new solutions bring also new challenges. Uh, so. When you use half infrastructure as code, you just need to start applying your development best practices to your infrastructure code. So whether it's tagging, branching, making releases, 
moving your in infrastructure code through the different stages of development, QA, or production. Uh, that's really important. So, like uh, we have our puppet manifests, and we run unit tests on those puppet manifests that describe the infrastructure. And uh, we make releases so we can all easily go back to previous versions and things like that. So everything that is being invented already for development, now you could do it with, uh, with infrastructure. So who here is able to, for instance, roll back to a previous version of their development project, being able to, for source code, right? Okay, and who is able to do that for infrastructure? So let's say you install a new package, you deploy there, things don't work, you need to roll back. But you don't only, you don't only re need to roll back your application, you also need to roll back the infrastructure that supports your application. So that's the kind of thing that you could do now with infrastructure as code. Well. You can tag your infrastructure, and you could say this is the version that goes with this version of the application, so they all become dependencies between them. Um, being able to, to use them together and rolling back and move forward and replicate them and so on. Another key concept here is the self-servicing. So we, this is something that became really popular with cloud, obviously. Um, so being able to have infrastructure available for you uh, anytime and that anybody, any developer, can have access to it, right? So that's what you can do with virtualization and cloud. And basically, you are giving the developers the, the power to do all these things by themselves without needing to go through long processes of uh, procurement or anything like that, right? So really what, is, what you are doing is uh, reducing the time to market, making shorter cycles, uh, which also helps on, on having continuous deployment. And uh, with great power comes also great responsibility. You need the developers to understand what that means, right? You have access to this cloud, you can start any machines as you want, but just make sure you clean up after you and things like that. So that needs to, to uh, be, be understood too. And there's uh, some tools out there that help greatly uh, achieve this uh, self-servicing. So one of them is Vagrant. Um, so Vagrant is a tool, command line tool on top of VirtualBox that allows you to easily start new VMs from the <laughs> command line provision them with Puppet or Chef, and destroy them, just as easy. Um, so this enables uh, the collaboration between developers and operations. So you could just share a base image, a base VM, and with Vagrant, you can provision that base VM with Puppet scripts or Chef scripts. Uh, so you could have your operations people write some Puppet script, and they give you, okay, this is uh, your background file that defines these are the puppet manifests, and this is the base VM, which a base VM is just, for instance, uh, like CentOS Minimal or a Debian, some sort of ISO. Uh, you could always do your own, but you can share these puppet scripts so developers can try in their machines, in their laptops, uh, the infrastructure that is being used in production which also is always very helpful for, you need to debug something, you need to find some problem, you need to test how something is gonna behave. Okay, I'm, I need to update some version of HTTPD or something else. Well, I wanna try it in, maybe in my machine with Vagrant, I can start the VM, try it with application, and then I can say the ops guys, oh yeah, I tried this and it works. Any questions so far? So, a little bit more about Puppet um, and Vagrant. I actually went ahead and mentioned some of these things. Uh, yeah. 
So you can share the configuration easily because it's just text files, so you can keep that in source control. And uh, you can also find uh, base boxes, uh, which are like the, the starting point, uh, the machines, the VMs. You can find them in vgrandbox.es, and you can build your own with, uh, with other tools that are out there. One of them is called VEWE, uh, V-E-E-W-E-E. -E that allows you to automatically create new new base boxes. So, how does uh, Vagrant uh, run like, like look like? So you just inst Vagrant is a Ruby project. You can just install it with gems. You can add base boxes uh, just passing the URL where where they are. Vagrant is gonna download them uh, and unpack them the first time you use them. Um, Vagrant init is gonna create a skeleton project. Vagrant app is going to start that VM and do whatever you told uh, Vagrant to do, provision with Puppet or Chef. Then you can do SSH to the machine and suspend it and resume it if you want. If you need to stop the the VM, and at the end you can just do Vagrant destroy and it, the machine disappears. So this is really helpful because you try something, doesn't work, or works or whatever, then you destroy the machine, you start from a clean clean state again. So for developers is is really really helpful for operations. They allow it allows them to also try things in their own in their own uh, machines. So something that you could do with cloud too. Uh, they are actually doing uh, adding support for more than VirtualBox, VMware um, since making it more like cloud agnostic or virtualization agnostic. So you could also, in the future, do VMware images and do the same, exactly the same process. So how does a VGRAM file look like? Uh, basically, you say what VM you want to use the name and where to download it if you don't have it already. Um, you can forward ports from your local box to the VM, or you can configure uh, IP, a uh, local network, with, uh, with its own interface. Um, you can share folders between your uh, host and the VM. And here, for instance, you, are, you can do a Puppet provisioning. You just say where the Puppet file is, uh, any parameters that you want to pass. And when you run Vagrant app, it's going to create a new VM, run Puppet inside the VM, and apply that Puppet manifest. So a Puppet manifest can be something so as easy as installing a JDK, you just define what package to, to install. Uh, you can also do some conditional things, like uh, I'm, depending on the different operating systems, the package has a different name. So that way you can make this manifest work across different OSs. So just say the JDK is installed. So whether you use RPM or you use Debian packages, this is going to install it for you. So I, I mentioned before I'm a Maven guy. Uh, Mostly I, I was. Um, so what we found ourselves, the, uh, what we wanted to do was uh, integrate both of them. So we, if you develop with Maven, uh, you, you want to provision it later on with Puppet. How to tie these bo both, both worlds together. So what who here use Maven to deploy things into a machine, like copying tarballs over and things like that? OK. So Maven is not really well designed to do that. <laughs> you can always, I've seen uh, people doing Maven call scripts that would just copy files over. Um, so what uh, we try to do, to do here uh, instead of using Antas, I've seen people doing Antas uh, plugin to copy files over or SSH, the assembly plugin to build tarballs or cargo to deploy to um, 
app servers or Capistrani during the Ruby world. Uh, so to avoid all that, uh, we can use Maven and Puppet together in a way that uh, you don't need to mess with, with all this uh, scripting. So you can provide operations, you can define your own mani Puppet manifests, you can provide them to operations, so there's no question of what is this thing doing? It's there, it's code, it's self-documented, of course. <laughs> So, and you can, most, mm, the most important thing is that it allows you to use the right tool for the right job, right? Maven is not done to deploy things. And Puppet is, it is, um, the same way that Puppet is not done to build Java projects. So we have created a Maven Puppet module that it's on GitHub that allows you to, with Puppet, fetch artifacts from a Maven repository. So we use the repository as a, like a central piece, uh, central location to share uh, builds and any binaries. And manages them with Puppet and you don't need any extra packaging like tarballs, building RPMs from your word files or anything like that. So it allows you to easily, you can define repositories uh, if you're familiar, so you just say what's, where the repository is, if you need a username and password. You can install Maven with just with these three lines here. You can use different versions of Maven. Uh, you can create a Maven settings file with uh, the repository information. So not, not only to deploy, but also if you have development machines that you want to configure, uh, you can use this and use Puppet. If you've seen the uh, GitHub just released the Boxer project uh, last week, I think. So it's, it allows you to configure your OS X, your MacBook, with Puppet, everything from scratch. So this is something that you could also, if you could also do, like I, I want this development machine to have the settings, and everybody in the company needs to have the same settings. So why not use Puppet to provision them? So that's what GitHub does with their own stuff, like installing all the different applications and configuring and for the new people that join GitHub. So they are up, uh, uh, up and running really fast. So that's, that's also applicable here. Um, and the most important part is we have created a Maven type that basically you say, where do you want some file what is the ID in the repository and what repository is to download it from? So this, behind the scenes, this runs a Maven plugin and it will connect to the repository and download that and copy it over to your, to your, to that path that you set. So you could do the same thing with just passing the different group, artifact version, packaging, and, and the repos. So, questions? You're all shy. You're gonna wait until I leave. So, I wanted to show you the examples. Um, so what I have here, let's see how I can explain this. I have, in my laptop I have running Jenkins and Archiva, uh, repository management, continuous integration tool. I have three machines that I call www, tomcat1, and db. Each of them are running already. They have Postgres, Tomcat, and HTTPD, typical three-tier uh, web um, stack. You could also have many Tomcat uh, instances and do load balancing, um, whatever you want to do. And I have a QA machine that has the three things installed, but this QA machine is not running. This QA machine is created on the fly and is destroyed at the end of the QA tests. So it's always starting from, uh, from scratch. So I have the, yeah, this is the same thing. I have the database and the Tomcat server. I have one, you could have any, any of them. And let's see. So I have, uh, with Puppet, 
you use, you, you can, the way to reuse code is having puppet modules. So let me go back for a second. Um, so we use one tool that is called Librarian Puppet that is basically dependency management for puppet modules. Uh, in a file, I can define what modules do I, do I want to use. So I want the Java module to install the JDK. I want the Apache module to stay, install HTTPD, Postgres, Firewall to module allows me to easily manage all the IP table stuff. Tomcat, uh, you, can, uh, you can get the, these modules from uh, forge.puppet.com, puppetlabs.com, I think it is. Or you can also get them from Git. So the ones that have a specific ver version set, they come from the Forge, which is some sort of like central repository of Puppet modules. Uh, this one comes from a fork I have in Git, so you can mix and match. Here we're using our Maven, mo our Maven module, uh, Avahi module to install. Uh, I use Avahi, that way I can use my, in my VMs I can use uh, name DNSs instead of having to remember the old IPs. And I have created a module in, in a path of the, of the source code to just uh, show you how to do a module and share class configuration across all the different nodes. Uh, the, w, the, web, uh, the web node, the database node, and all the other ones. So in that module, what I have, I have created a class. That's what Puppet calls it. Um, so I'm saying a DB node for me is a, is a node that has Postgres server installed. With, I can set the password. And if you look at the documentation of, of each module, they should give you uh, all the parameters that you can use. So it allows you to create databases and more stuff. So this is installing the Postgres server. This is creating a, a database. So I'm using as an example the AppFuse uh, web application project, which is uh, just a demo, a uh, simple web application. So I'm creating a database for that. For the Tomcat uh, node, uh, I'm installing Java. I can pass also the distribution, so I want the OpenJDK 1.6. I'm installing Tomcat, creating a Tomcat instance. This, what this specific module does, it allows you to have multiple instances of Tomcat running in the same box, and they don't clash, uh, so they're all using different ports. So if one dies, other one can continue. In this case, I'm only installing one of them, but that's why uh, there's like the duplication. I'm installing Maven, and I'm telling uh, Maven to get uh, the AppFuse war uh, in this specific location, the server Tomcat AppFuse web apps. So that's where Tomcat is installed in the previous step. So this would download that war, install Tomcat, and this would get me Tomcat running with that, with that web app in the, in the root path. There's more, no, there's more classes. I'll, I'll share the, the code later in GitHub. Yes. No. Probably the answer that, but uh, how do I, how do you make sure that the version that you install really works? So usually the way I do it is I deploy it on one or two machines, and then to the other 500. Okay. So he he's asking how the version, how do you ensure the version really works? Um, Yes, I'm going to answer that because so we run uh, the QA test on the continuous integration server. So we do uh, Cucumber tests on so it's uh, with WebDriver. So when we bring up the machine, we test that whatever we want to test, right? Like the app is running there, and there's some text showing up, showing up. And in the site.pp is the main entry point for Puppet. So I'm importing all the nodes with all the def definitions for the different machines. And I can define the parent node that uh, all the other ones will inherit. And uh, where's, that's where I'm installing EPL, repository, and Avahi for, for all of them. So the, 
the Tomcat node, for instance, that would be into manifest nodes. I'm saying every any machine that matches that regular expression, so Tomcat 1, Tomcat 2, or Tomcat any number, uh, is going to have the old inherits the parent class, so the parent node, so it's going to have the Abahi configuration, it's going to have a message of the day, and it's going to use the class Tomcat node that I defined earlier in my private module. So this is, this is what I actually uses the classes in the module. And what I did for a QA node is it has the DB node, the Tomcat node, and the WWW node. That way I can reuse them. So each specific node uh, will have the DB node, will have the class DB node, the Tomcat node is not going to have the class Tomcat node, and the WWW is going to have the WWW node. And this QA has all of them. So I'm reusing the same classes across all the different machines that I'm starting. And you can also run uh, unit tests on your Puppet, node, Puppet manifests. So for instance, what we are doing here for the node, uh, the db.acme.com, I can set a specific facts, uh, which is what uh, some things that are provided by the by the puppet agent running on the VM. So it's, I can I'm able to get what OS, how much RAM does it have, and what is the IP of the node, and things like that. So I can say provided that the machine has these facts, like it's a Red Hat, uh, Red Hat uh, CentOS 6.3 machine. <laughs> Uh, it should contain the class Postgres server. So you can say there's a syntax and our spec puppet allows you to say it should contain some package or it should contain some file or the contents of some file should match this regular expression. So this is what we use for, for the testing of the infrastructure itself, all the puppet manifests go through. So this also checks syntax when you run our spec. It's going to compile the the catalog, the Puppet manifest. So that will be the basic testing before creating any machine with them. And like the WWW spec uh, is the same thing. I just say it should contain the package HTTPD. So that will be the very first step. And now moving on to some examples. Okay, so I have Jenkins running um, with, uh, do, do, do. for this part would be uh, the first project. So I have a fuse, which is just the Java Maven build. This is building the whole project and creating a WAR file and deploying it to the repository. Uh, I have the QA. Uh, this is cr running Vagrant, uh, creating a QA machine and running uh, Cucumber uh, specs against that machine. So it's basically like Selenium testing or web driver testing. So I can run tests on the final running machine. And I have uh, these three uh, projects that basically what they do, they call Puppet on the production machines. The three that I have, DB, Tomcat1, and WWW. And this all happens in, in chain. So when I upfuse finishes, then QA runs, and when QA runs, all these other three run. The other two examples I have is if uh, are for uh, our maestro tools, so I can show you later if we have time how to do the same. How would we do the same thing with maestro? So I have www.local that comes from Avahi. So this is the production machine. And I have, okay, so this is the AppFuse project. 
I'm going to add some text to the login page. And <coughs> I have a, with Git, I have a post commit hook. Uh, the first one is the one with uh, Jenkins. And the second one would be for Maestro. Uh, so I'm going to show you first the Jenkins one. So every time I commit something, I'm sending a uh, with curl, I'm sending a HTTP get to Jenkins to say, this has changed, do, do, do your build. So that. Carlos, you're not, just, you're not just configuring the Jenkins job to pull Git? Hmm? You're not just configuring the Jenkins job to pull Git? No, I don't, I don't pull. Uh, if you hear some people talk about that, they say polling is evil. Uh, you should not do polling if you could do pushing. That way, you are not hammering the, the source control every time. You just get uh, notifications and builds when there are actual changes. And if you use things like GitHub, uh, it gives you the webhooks uh, where you can set the URL that uh, when I, whenever a new commit is, is, uh, is pushed, you get a notification to, to do your build. Yes. I wanted to mention at the ASF we have uh, SVM PubSub, but we also now have Git PubSub, so you can subscribe to your repositories. Um. Okay, so at the ASF we have both for push for uh, subversion and Git. So, um, so let me push. Uh, okay. Which, uh, oops. So, there it is. So you can see it. Uh, so let's do something. Committing. Oh, great. So I just made a commit. And um, we go back to J Jenkins. Uh, anytime now, it's going to start building up fuse. There it is. So this has triggered the whole thing. This is going to take a little bit, depending also on the internet connection. I'm cheating because I'm using VMs that are pre-provisioned most of the stuff. So we are not waiting here downloading the packages for HTTP and Tomcat and this and other. Uh, but the word file is being built, is being pushed to the repository. What I'm doing is depending on the snapshot version. So every time a new snapshot is built and I run Puppet, it's going to get the latest one. So while this runs, I'll show you. So I have these other three VMs uh, running, which are the three production ones I mentioned. And let me show. So this is the. This would be the project, uh, Vagrant project with all the Puppet modules and manifests and everything is there, right? So I have a Vagrant file, which the interesting parts are here. So I'm defining a QA VM. With Vagrant, you can, you, you're not limited to define one VM. You can define as many as you want. So I'm defining a QA one, and then the DB, Tomcat1, and www. So I can set the host name. That way, Puppet will recognize what, what's, the, what's the VM and how it should be provisioned. And I'm saying, yeah, just use the, my modules are in the module path, and my site, use my site.pp to, to provision the VM. And I can forward ports. Uh, I'm using a host-only network. That way, I can connect to those VMs without going through the through the forwarding of the ports. And I do the same thing for the DB, Tomcat One, and www. So this is what you define in your background file. Um, in the Puppet file, this is used by Librarian Puppet. So this is what I'm where I'm defining what modules do I want to use, uh, what versions. And uh, so the site.pp, which is the entry point, I have added some more things uh, that you see in the slides. 
uh, basically to deal with IP tables firewalling. Um, but if we go to the DB, so this is a DB node. Tomcat is using the, that class. So the node definitions are just using classes, so I can reuse the classes. And the classes I defi are defined in my module here, where I have a DB node with the server, install the Postgres server, create the AppFuse database, and then I'm doing other stuff that is needed for AppFuse, which is like uh, get the SQL dump and import it into the database, and enable open the firewall for that port. Uh, at the www is even easier. I'm just saying create a virtual host at Apache that points to the, to the Tomcat server. So I can use variables here with uh, Puppet. I'm saying point to tomcat1.local 8080. So if I go to www.local, in the port 80 is just doing the proxy thing with, with Tomcat. And the interesting part of the integration with, uh, with Tomcat and Maven, so in the Tomcat node, Tomcat class, what I'm doing is install Java, install Tomcat, create a Tomcat instance on the port 8080. So I need to, ins so basically this is the location of the word file on the file system. This is where Tomcat is gonna uh, pick it up. I'm installing Maven. I'm downloading the web app. Uh, so the web app is uh, AppFuse Spring, and I can use the version that I, so I can define uh, default values on the top of the class, or I can pass them. So different nodes can have different values. And uh, copy that word file over the Tomcat uh, web apps directory. And because I'm using Postgres, I need to do a little bit more work there. Uh, that's why, that's because I just didn't want to change that fuse work file. Uh, so I'm doing it on the fly every time I deploy. Uh, and zip the work file, configure AppFuse to use Postgres. So I'm getting also the jar file for the Postgres JDBC driver, uh, configuring a, a properties file, just setting the, the right values and adjusting the hibernated properties to do some changes and uh, create any other folder that was needed by AppFuse. So this is the most complex one of, of the three nodes, um, but that's the, that's the one that allows me to just get whatever it is in the Maven repository and publish it. Yeah, the, the, oh, the variation here in the properties. So one of the var things that I do for variation is, um, okay, so obviously the HTTPD needs to know where Tomcat is to do the proxying, for instance, and the Tomcat node needs, Tomcat node needs to know where the Postgres database is. So by default, I use the uh, names here, the defaults, that's, so I'm saying, the Tomcat host is in tomcat1.local. That would be my default. And what I'm doing in the QA node is passing that explicitly. So I tell, I tell uh, Tomcat in the QA node to use the, sorry, I'm telling, yeah, HTTPD to use the Tomcat server that is in localhost. So I don't want it to go to Tomcat 1, which is my tom production Tomcat server. I, for QA, I just want to use the local one. So you one. have different nodes to represent the different parts. Right, right. They, I have, there's four nodes, www, Tomcat 1, and DB, which are like production, let's say. And then QA is something that gets started from scratch and destroyed at the end of the tests which uh, are running right now. So AppFuse, the build has finished, the word file is deployed through Archiva, and I have the AppFuse running, uh, sorry, the QA tests running. 
So in QA, what I'm doing is running the, the dots you see here are the tests passing on the Puppet manifests. So once you validate that the Puppet manifests are OK, uh, I'm creating, uh, I'm destroying with Vagrant Destroy, I'm destroying the VM if it existed. And I'm creating uh, the VM again with Vagrant App QA. So I'm starting from scratch. Let me see if I can, yeah. So this is creating the VM and then running Puppet. Uh, this is failing because of the network, so it's trying to update uh, uh, the packages. But when this finishes, it's going to finish provisioning. And when it does, what I have set up for it to do is uh, Cucumber tests. If you are not familiar with Cucumber, um, so you can do like natural language sort of testing. Um, so you could do whatever you want to do with Selenium, WebDriver, any other test uh, system out there. So basically what I'm checking is I have my services running. They're all listening on these ports. Behind the scenes, this is actually doing the checking that those ports are open. And I say, given that I'm at the login page, I should see the text signing. So it, that's validating a little bit more than the app is running. So you could write any sort of testing that you wanted, uh, as complex as you want. And that's running as part of, let me show you. Okay, I'm running Drake, and Drake has, So this is the part where it's running the tests. So fairly simple. It points to uh, here. It is the M. Uh, uh, where? Oh, yeah. I'm here. Is where I configure Cucumber to to have the to point to the QA server. So it's running all those all those tests against that. And at some point, this is going to finish. Oh, what did happen? It failed. Of course. All the demos fail when you are doing them. And the OK, close stream. I guess there's some URL, uh, some network connectivity issues. Damn it. Let me see if the VM is up. No. OK. So what would actually happen afterwards <laughs> is that all these three uh, uh, jobs would be triggered. So I'm triggering them manually. Is it, uh, yes, no, oh, yeah. So this is simulating uh, a puppet run on those, on, well, it's actually running a puppet run on those uh, machines. If you have something more complex, there's tools out there that will allow you to do more complex, like get into the machines and run puppet. There's a tool called M Collective that does that for you. But this is just SSHing into the box and running Puppet Apply. And at some point, this is going to finish, but <coughs> maybe it fails because of the network. And uh, the, w, the, web, uh, the website should be updated. So while that fails, uh, any questions? I think I'll speak loud enough. I don't need to go on the mic. Uh, <laughs> if you would start a project like this, um, what would you concentrate on initially? Like Maven and Puppet, just get get your uh, your Puppet uh, deployments and configuration up to uh, up to snuff that you can run them manually, and then after that introduce Maven and then start having a structure for for uh, for pushing it even more. Uh, like I'm talking about 
you're going from a manual state to a fully up automated state. Mm -hmm. What would be your best progression if you wanted to move it forward? What would be the, the best path? Okay, so th this was just an example of t with the tools I chose. I mean, you could have, uh, if you already have an uh, end project or any other project, they always deploy it. You ha always have to deploy something yeah. somewhere. So with Puppet, you can automate the, the deployment from that so development site location to, to the machines. Uh, so obviously, automation needs to be done like a little step at a time, I think mostly because people won't buy in. And uh, um, if you're using CI, you can easily uh, skip adding new, new features. And uh, the defining your infrastructure with Puppet is something really cool that you can do and reuse pretty, pretty easily. Uh, OK, I'm down. OK, I, I have no more time for questions. No? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, give me out. <laughs>